If you were into serious off-road motorcycle riding in the 1960s, your options were pretty limited. The bike of choice for desert racing in California was really the big 650cc Triumph TR6. As successful as these bikes were in that specific arena, these motorcycles were big, heavy production street bikes with little more than an off-road disguise. If you were tearing up trails or even trying your hand at the budding new sport called motocross, oddly enough your dream bike might come from Europe and specifically Spain. The off-road segment was one of the few categories at this point not yet entirely taken over by the Japanese manufacturers. That is, until Yamaha made the DT1. Now before we go any further, I want to give a big shout out to Ethos, which is the sponsor for today's video. Now I'm guessing if you're like me and you ride motorcycles somewhat regularly, you can't help but think about the possibility of things going sideways and what that would mean for those closest to you. As I have a wife and small children, having life insurance is essential for me. I'm the sole income for them and I think it's important not to ignore those hard thoughts of what it would mean for your family if something went wrong. And if you've ridden for any period of time you know, on a motorcycle, and really anywhere, things can go wrong fast. The great thing is Ethos makes it so easy to purchase and move forward with life insurance. It used to be difficult and expensive to get life insurance with Ethos 100% online application process with no need for medical exams and blood tests. It's fast, easy, and affordable, and it's a no-brainer. If you don't have life insurance already, there's no need to procrastinate. And the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. So if you guys are interested in learning more about Ethos, maybe you want to get a free quote, check out the link in the description below. And again, big thanks to Ethos for supporting the channel. As the popularity of off-road riding was really growing among the general motorcycle community through the 60s, Yamaha's initial answer to this demand was a number of little scrambler bikes known as the Trailmaster series. With a new kind of freedom that puts zest in your daily life. Yamaha. These were essentially Yamaha's small displacement road going models with a few extra bits like wider handlebars and high pipes and engine guards. In short, like most options available to riders in the mid 60s, they weren't exactly full fledged off road dedicated motorcycles. These bikes were mostly meant to compete with Honda's new trail bikes and they were pretty successful, but here in the States, there were a few people at Yamaha USA that felt that the company could do better. Now it's also important to note that around this time, Yamaha was already developing their first single cylinder factory motocross bike in a model called the YX26. And the work put into this bike would really help speed up the process for the DT1 when the idea would come around. Prior to the YX26, Yamaha's two stroke race bikes were mostly twins, which is a great configuration for the road, but when the bikes were stripped down for off-road racing, and especially when the elements were against them, Suzuki and Honda's singles really proved more capable. The YX26 developed essentially in tandem with the DT1, and over time these projects would essentially be considered one project. Well, it would essentially be like the precursor to the DT1, and it would have its own success immediately in its debut for the All Japan Motocross Championship. Now the biggest piece of development for this machine over Yamaha's previous two strokes was the transition from rotary disc valve induction to piston reed valve induction, primarily to minimize the width of the engine. This would massively impact all of Yamaha's two-stroke engines going forward. Now shortly after Yamaha began working on the YX26 over in Japan, across the Pacific, a young American Yamaha employee and desert racer named Dave Holman took his friend and fellow Yamaha employee, head of R&D at Yamaha USA, named Jack Hole, to come out and watch some of the races. Now over time, and after watching all the countless different kinds of motorcycles that were participating in this off-road racing, they realized that Yamaha could potentially make a motorcycle to fill in some of the gaps that they were seeing in the motorcycles that were being raced. Their idea of the perfect off-road bike would be a small 250cc lightweight dirt bike capable of off-road riding and racing, but that could also be road to work Monday through Friday. At the time, the closest thing to this coming out of Japan was really just twin street bikes with high pipes attached. Nothing like what Dave and Jack envisioned had ever been produced by a Japanese company, and in the end, it hadn't even been made really by anybody. This would essentially be a dual sport or enduro motorcycle. Now at this time, they worked to build a sort of 
Frankenstein prototype of the bike that they wanted Yamaha to make, using various parts from different motorcycles, some from Yamaha, and many from a specific Montessa motorcycle. And eventually, Yamaha USA decided to go all in on the idea, and they started to hound Yamaha headquarters to make what they believed would be a game-changing kind of off-road motorcycle for the American market. Road-going models were in decline for most manufacturers as the mid-60s carried on. This is why so many companies were rushing to develop better, what we could call, early dirt bikes. But Dave and Jack had a different idea. In 1966, they gave a presentation to Yamaha going over the need for this new model, one that would revolutionize the lightweight off-road segment by providing a new level of versatility. And Yamaha responded by sending over a group of engineers and designers to get a feel for the off-road market here in the States. What Jack and Dave wanted seemed impossible at first. A 250cc off-road machine capable of tackling trails and trials and even motocross racing, but also fit and legal for road use. If Yamaha could pull this off, they would have essentially a new kind of motorcycle, what many would call the first enduro. But they had to simplify things if they were going to be able to move forward, so the designers and engineers landed on three simple goals for this motorcycle. One, keep the weight under 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. Two, keep the width of the motorcycle as a whole as low as possible. And three, maximize the torque of the engine. In regards to making this new kind of bike, Yamaha really did have one advantage. They'd already begun working on the factory motocross race bike known as the YX26, so they took that design and began reworking it for this new production model. But quite a bit of work was necessary. One engineer who worked on the race-ready YX26 describes the ideal race machine in his mind as a machine where the engine is nearly finished when the bike crosses the finish line. Not exactly your goal in making a production bike, hopefully one ride doesn't just destroy the thing. But that really shows Yamaha's commitment to performance in making race-ready engines. So quite a bit was changed for the DT1's engine, mainly in the pursuit of reliability over outright performance. The bike featured piston port for simplicity, the size of the crankshaft was increased, and the overall engine was just kind of beefed up to be able to handle what riders would throw at it here in the States. It featured Yamaha's already revolutionary auto lube system, eliminating the need for oil and gas mixing. This engine and the bike as a whole was really tested extensively in Japan and also back here in the States for performance and overall durability. In the end, Yamaha would find just over 18 horsepower and about 22 newton meters of torque from this little 246cc two-stroke. These were really good numbers for such a small, lightweight bike, and the engine was just beautifully simple and thus reliable. There's nothing simpler and easier to work on than a cylinder port two-stroke single. Virtually every part of the YX26 was redesigned for maximum weight savings, and Yamaha did some pretty radical stuff at this time to reach their goal of a sub-100 kilogram bike. High tensile steel pipe was used to make a thin, lightweight but durable new chassis, a specifically designed really wide rear tire was used, and altogether in a simple, sleek package, Yamaha knew that with this motorcycle they could have a real winner on their hands. Now before going into production, they took a final prototype to America for testing on motocross tracks with really legit riders, and what they found was that with a few simple adjustments, namely removing the road-going elements like the lights and turn signals, the DT1 was pretty much on par with any factory motocross machine available. Now at this time, Yamaha was selling around 4,000 units in America per year, but expectations were really high for the DT1, and the company figured that 12,000 units for the new bike for the first year could potentially be done, and they were right. When this bike was unveiled and released, they could not keep it in stock. It wouldn't take long for Yamaha to start selling over 50,000 DT1s per year. This bike was so successful, it would essentially spearhead the Japanese invasion of the entire off-road market, bringing in Suzuki and Honda clones of the DT1, and an entire range of DT bikes from Yamaha. This bike is really the forerunner of all great Japanese off-road machines, including iconic motorcycles like the Honda Elsinore. The DT1 was essentially Japanese reliability and affordability brought to the high-end dirt bike segment. It was very much competitive with the offerings of Boltaco and Greaves and CZ, but without all the headache and at around 600 bucks, it was quite a bit more affordable. And you could jump off the trails and take the bike out on the open road or down to the local motocross track. The custom scene at this point was really blowing up, 
and the DT1 would prove to be a fantastic platform for this, with kits available to turn the 246cc engine into a 322cc fire breather. One of the rarely mentioned parts of the DT1 and its influence on dirt bikes going forward is its styling. It has a beautiful simplicity to it. The stripped back, simple form of this bike, from that little uncomplicated two-stroke engine, the large high pipe, and overall small but just coherent proportions, the DT1 is a motorcycle that looks really built for a purpose, which just happens to be going almost anywhere. Back in 67, the Yamaha YX26 had taken the All Japan Motocross Championship, which at this time was just a single race. Now in 68, just a few months after the release of the DT1, they decided to fit a factory tuning kit to the production model to see how it would fare, and Tado Suzuki dominated the competition in front of some 20,000 onlookers. In regards to the legacy of the DT1, much like the Honda CB750 for the road-going market, it didn't take long for the significance of this motorcycle to be apparent for the off-road world. In a 1987 issue of Cycle World, Steve Ballmer ponders the possibility of the Yamaha DT1 being the single most significant motorcycle of the past 25 years. He points out the problem with the off-road segment as a whole prior to the DT1 and explains how influential it was. He says the problem many riders were running into was that there was no real motorcycle capable of delivering satisfying performance on the street, but also had enough dirt prowess to be fun in the woods and on the trails. Sure, there were a few weak exceptions, such as the Scrambler models offered by some manufacturers. Scramblers were nothing more than variations on existing street bike models. Motorcycles alleged to be off-road worthy by virtue of having upswept exhaust pipes and trials universal type tires. But these pseudo dirt bikes were heavy, complex, relatively expensive, and had absolutely the wrong kind of power. In fairly dramatic fashion, Yamaha changed all that in 1968 by introducing the 250cc DT1 Enduro. A genuine jack of all trades, the DT1 was built from the ground up as a dual purpose machine for the street and the dirt, rather than being yet another half hearted attempt to scramblerize a street bike. It had a power plant and a chassis that both were a lot closer to the off road state of the art than anything Japan had ever before offered. The very best European motocrossers still were better, certainly, but not by light years. On the road, the Yamaha was a notch down from most pure street bikes of the day, but once the pavement stopped, any comparison between the DT1 and other street legal motorcycles was no contest. Thus, the DT1 gave birth to a new philosophy. A good dirt bike makes an okay street bike, but a good street bike makes a lousy dirt bike. Just as important though, the DT1 gave new riders the opportunity to have an honest-to-god dirt bike and a passable street machine all in one easy to ride package. Despite its success in racing, this is really Yamaha's greatest achievement with the DT1. Like so many other great and influential motorcycles from history, the key was solving a real problem or need that riders were facing with a motorcycle that fills a large gap. Interestingly enough, this problem of needing a proper all-around motorcycle, an enduro really, wasn't exactly being vocalized by most riders at this time, and that's why Yamaha was the first to the punch. It wasn't really a motorcycle that was a response to constant complaints or thoughts from riders. When they pitched this idea to Yamaha headquarters, Yamaha USA were literally trying to predict the future of motorcycling. They saw the decline that was happening for just regular street riding motorcycles and the boom of off-road enthusiasm, and they rightly predicted that a thoroughly capable off-road machine that could also be taken on road at least comfortably could be the motorcycle of the future. Now over time the DT platform would go through multiple evolutions, but perhaps the most significant change would come when Yamaha decided to bring more of their racing tech to the DT1. But like the DT1, the YZ range didn't find its start in Japan, rather in Southern California when Don Jones began experimenting with a DT1 to make a race bike for his son Gary. Through significant weight savings and by lowering the frame, the bike was massively successful in motocross before the first ever American motocross championship even took place, which Gary would go on to win on this bike by the way. In the end, this motorcycle that they were essentially working on this customized DT1 would get sent over to Japan and would eventually become what we now know of as the YZ range. And that bike would be one of the single most influential race motorcycles of all time. The YZ range would replace the DT 
in the early 70s, and would really become the platform for more first important pieces of tech than probably any other motorcycle in history, from reed valves to monoshock suspension. Now, interestingly enough, we seem to kind of be in a similar place today. The future of regular on-road motorcycle travel is somewhat unknown, but for very different reasons, and many manufacturers are turning to the off-road segment to see what kinds of interesting, influential bikes can be produced because off-road motorcycles might be the future. I think it's fair to say, though, in the same way that there was nothing like the DT1 prior to its release, there may never be anything like it going forward. Alright guys, thanks for watching. Again, big shout out to Ethos for sponsoring this video. And as always, let us know your experience with this motorcycle if you have any. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the next video. Ride safe.